Good evening, this is your 28storms.com cyclone update for Monday the 19th of December. Starting off as we always do with the latest outlooks from the Bureau of Meteorology, we see that the Darwin Regional Forecast Center has increased the probability of development in the Arafura Sea to moderate by Thursday. And although we're not expecting any development over western Australia or points just toward the north, they are not ruling out the possibility of that developing Arafura Low from spreading westward into their region. And if that wasn't enough, the Brisbane Regional Forecast Center is also monitoring an area of low pressure in the Coral Sea, and they are giving that feature a high chance of development into a cyclone by Wednesday or Thursday. Sunset is upon us, and I apologize for the choppiness of the latest visible satellite animation, but we can make out both of the developing tropical disturbances. The first one is more than likely originating from this disturbed weather currently over the Gulf of Carpentaria. Fortunately, there are no signs of significant pressure falls or a very clearly well-defined surface circulation at this time, but this overall cloud mass should continue to drift more toward the northwest and eventually spread over Darwin, increasing the chances of precipitation, including the threat of heavy rainfall, and the system over the Coral Sea is also not very well defined just yet, but it is showing some signs of perhaps some very slow development. Here is a different look at both of our tropical disturbances using the latest standard infrared satellite imagery, and you do get the overall feel that development will be very slow to occur although there are some signs of perhaps some very slight organization and the latest water vapor animation shows that the upper level conditions still appear to be fairly favorable along the northern tier of the Australian coast. We see that there is a trough draped across much of the central portion of the country but just toward the north we do have anticyclonic flow which is favorable when you see that aloft and it looks as though the upper level winds will remain favorable for the foreseeable future. The following is a microwave satellite pass taken of the disturbance in the Coral Sea roughly eight hours ago, and you really don't get the picture that this system is overly well defined just yet. And as we advance this, this is now the most recent microwave satellite pass taken nearly just about one hour ago, and there really hasn't been all that much in the way of any significant change in organization. Meanwhile, the latest precipitable water animation can often give us good clues as to where a developing area of low pressure may be present and we don't really see much in the way of any cyclonic spin in the Gulf region just yet and that system more than likely won't begin to organize much more until it begins to clear the coast as it drifts toward the north and eventually makes its way just to the north of Darwin, Australia and the system in the Coral Sea is beginning to show a little bit more sign in the way of cyclonic spin but again development in that region is more than likely going to be very slow in nature as it will take time for that area of low pressure to detach itself somewhat from the monsoon trough. The latest low-level vorticity analysis from the University of Wisconsin confirms the fact that the vorticity over the Coral Sea remains very elongated from east to west, and of course if you want to have a true tropical cyclone development, then this whole area is going to have to become a lot more concentrated, and that will take a couple of days to do so. And the area of low pressure or vorticity is still fairly weak in the Gulf, and it will more than likely remain weak until it begins to inch a little bit more toward the north into this region. Furthermore, although upper-level winds are marginally favorable for development, the favorable upper-level ridge that is supportive of tropical cyclogenesis is a little bit toward the south of the Gulf region at this time, and that is the main reason why we are seeing some slight easterly wind shear over the Arafura Sea, so this does not bode well for immediate development in the short term, but that's not to say that conditions won't improve once we get into the medium range. And the same can be said in the Coral Sea where we do have quite a lot of wind shear, although it's primarily located across the south and central part of the Coral Sea. So what can we anticipate from both of these systems in the future? Well, I wish I could say that once we show the latest dynamical forecast model guidance that we would have a little bit more in the way of confidence, but unfortunately there is actually more model disagreement today than there was at this time yesterday. So as we begin with the latest zero-z run from the GFS forecast model, Slow development does occur, and we do get a cyclone out of that system in the Coral Sea, but the stronger of the two systems is the one that emerges in the Arafura, and it becomes a minimal tropical cyclone near Darwin, and then it begins to move toward the south into the inland communities before it really has much of a chance to become a significant cyclone. But the drawback of that is if it stalls over the inland communities for an extended period of time, then we do run the risk of some heavy rainfall and potential flooding. With that said, here is a look at the eight-day precipitation accumulation forecast from the same model. And some of these darker colors across the Northern Territory is denoting areas receiving in excess of eight to 10 inches of rainfall. 
and that amounts to roughly 200 to 250 millimeters of precipitation. But keep in mind the only chance of these precipitation totals verifying is if the GFS completely nails the overall track forecast. However, as I stated just a moment ago, there is quite a lot of model disagreement today and this will become very apparent as we switch over to the latest forecast from the ECMWF model and as we go into 24, 48, and 72 hours there's really not much in the way of any significant tropical development although the low in the Coral Sea is becoming gradually better defined and as we go into day 4 and day 5 we begin to see a little bit more in the way of tropical cyclogenesis in both regions but the difference between the GFS and ECMWF model tracks with regard to the Darwin system is really in the 6 to 10 day period as you will see that system near Darwin begins to intensify a little bit more but instead of drifting due toward the south it actually makes a shift more toward the east and is actually back into the Gulf by day 10. If that weren't enough we're going to take a look at the ECMWF model ensemble member average and as we go into 24 and 48 hours, the system near the Coral Sea, it looks like the model members are in general agreement with that system continuing to deepen or intensify ever so slightly. And as we go into day 3 and day 4, that looks like the general timetable for development just to the north of Darwin. But as we go into day 5 and especially day 6, it looks as though half of the model members are taking the system more toward the southwest while some of the other ensembles are in general agreement with the operational run by taking it more toward the east back into the Gulf. So with that said, the question that begs to be asked is why are the models split into two different tracks with regard to that stronger system near Darwin? Well, in order to answer that question, we must first turn to the latest 500 HPA level steering analysis and this is the main level in the atmosphere that really dictates the movement of tropical cyclone tracks and we'll start off at the current hour and you will first notice that there is a 588 decameter ridge centered over the southeast Indian Ocean extending into western Australia and this ridge is going to persist over the next 48 to 72 hours and if we had a fairly well-defined cyclone sitting to the north of the Kimberley coast the flow around this ridge would highly suggest a general west to west southwest movement but the problem with that overall forecast track in this case is that as of right now we're really not dealing with a very strong cyclone so therefore the 500 hectopascal level in the atmosphere is actually not the dominant steering level just yet and as we go into day four that is when we begin to see the area of low pressure even begin to show up at this level in the mid layers but by this point we're also beginning to see a return of troughiness across much of Queensland and the difference between the two model camps is that some of the models are showing this trough beginning to capture the cyclone which would start to induce more of a southeasterly track back toward the poles while some of the other models are showing the system drifting enough toward the west and strengthening so that it gets captured by the ridge toward the south and then begins to drift a little bit more toward the western Australian coastline so which model solution is correct? Well unfortunately it's just too early to make that determination but one thing that does look fairly certain is that areas around the Northern Territory especially surrounding Darwin look to have an increasing chance of heavy rainfall and that will be the main concern over the next two to five days. It does look as though the system will become a classified cyclone once it begins to organize in the Arafura Sea and as to how strong it gets will also be greatly dictated by how much land interaction occurs but the one bit of good news today is that the system over the Coral Sea is unlikely to make a direct impact along the Queensland coast as it looks like we will still have enough mid-latitude westerly flow over Queensland partly in association with that developing trough in the medium range that will keep the system just toward the east. So thank you again for following 28storms.com slash cyclone. If you found this video from an external source don't forget to check out the page that these videos originate from. Again, you can check out 28storms.com and just click on Cyclone near the top, and that will bring you to this page where you will find our daily video updates, including a multitude of links containing weather information for much of Australia and the tropical cyclones that form around this region. And we've also added a little tab toward the right that includes some Twitter updates from some reliable sources across the Internet. One of those reliable sources is Oz Cyclone Chasers. They are a very close partner with us here at 28storms.com 
and whenever a cyclone threatens to make landfall near Australia, their intention is to stream live video of the cyclone to their website. So you can go ahead and check out their website or like them on Facebook. And they are also frequently updating their chase plans at a forum called xweatherlive.com. So don't forget to check that out. So thanks again for tuning in, and that's all for now. But stay tuned because we will have another video update posted by tomorrow afternoon.